Well, here we are. We have reached Christmas Eve, and this is the official conclusion of the infamous Christmas cake, or as we Americans call it, the fruit cake, or as the Victorians called it, the rich fruit cake. And we are going to decorate this mother. I have a huge mound of marzipan here, and I am just using my own strength to soften it so that it is pliable enough to roll out and then cover the cake with. And this is where a lot of recipes for fruit cake really take a turn in terms of American versus British tastes and history, because the only rich fruit cakes that I could find throughout history, in terms of the United States, were uncovered fruit cakes usually decorated with nuts or dried fruit. And as we get into the 20th century, then the dried fruit is usually nuts. And then as we get into the 20th century, then we're looking at usually nuts and, and things like glacier or maraschino cherries. This is a definite British tradition that doesn't really happen anywhere except in countries that are heavily influenced by British culture. So sometimes in areas of the West Indies, they would make these cakes in India and in uh, other empirically occupied places, then this cake continues to be a hit. But other than that, it's really only the Brits who cover their cakes in marzipan then cover them even further with royal icing. So that's what we're going to do, is we're going to do the thing that by the time Queen Victoria was on the throne was already very popular, and you probably have Cromwell's England to thank for that about two centuries earlier, where basically people had to disguise their Christmas cakes because while feasting was okay, feasting because of Christmas was frowned upon because it was apparently just too much of an excess for Puritans. So what they would do is they would make the Christmas cake and then they would cover it in marzipan to hide it from being thought of as a Christmas cake. So now it's nice and pliable and I could shape it however I want to. So now we're gonna roll it out. Look, I don't know what it is about this work surface, but the only way that I can get things not to stick, no matter how much powdered sugar or flour I put on the surface, is if I put plastic underneath. So please don't judge the top layer of this poor marzipan cake because it just stuck to the table and I had to roll it out again. And so now it is obviously beautifully marbled. Now this is apricot jam and all I'm doing is I'm spreading it before I put the cake on top. Yes, I forgot before. That's why all these little bits are just hanging around. It's been one of those days, okay? <laughs> the late, great Julia Child used to say, no one will see it. So now this should ensure that the marzipan actually sticks to the cake this time instead of only sort of sticks. And here we go. <laughs> Third time is the charm, right? There we are. So now I am actually going to nest it in. And that just means that I'm pressing against the bottom surface of the cake and in an effort not to push on the cake itself then I'm using this as the kind of cake stand for it and now we should be able to go around and cut off the excess and then make it nice and flat on top at least that's the hope
point you must be thinking, oh my gosh, Tara, that looks terrible. What are you gonna do? But honestly, it's all gonna be covered, so I'm not too concerned, even if it does look kind of horrible. So all I am doing is going around and I am patching some of the places that didn't quite get flat the first time. And while I don't have a cake scraper as such, I do have this spatula. And so I am just working around the top of the cake and the sides and trying to make it flat because this is going to be the base for the decorations that will go on the top and the sides. And there you have it. I think that Mr. Francatelli, Queen Victoria's personal chef, would be appalled, actually. He'd be pretty appalled at what he sees here. It's going to be under a layer of icing, so no one will see the mess that this is. But what we have to do first is we have to let it dry because it's very sticky right now. And so once it dries, and that usually takes a couple of days, then we can put the rest of the decor on top. After the cake is covered in marzipan and it's set out to dry, then I'm gonna do the same thing with the decorations that are gonna go on top. Now, traditionally speaking, decorations on top could be anything from edible flowers and plants to oranges that have been sliced and preserved to pieces made of marzipan, and that's exactly what I'm doing right now. So I have these candy molds and I am going to dust them with powdered sugar, like so. And the Victorians would have had candy molds like this too. It's just that they probably wouldn't have been made of silicon. It probably would have been tin, or if you were super fancy, maybe copper. But they used molds for lots and lots of things. And molds span way, way before the Victorian era. So don't you worry, this is gonna be kind of a traditional cake. So now that I've eaten my weight in marzipan, I mean, um, made all the decorations, then what we're going to do is leave these to dry overnight. I will put some plastic on them. And then tomorrow, it's cake decorating time, hopefully. We're going to be decorating the cake today with royal icing. And royal icing is something that has been made for a very, very long time. You literally just whip up some egg whites with some powdered sugar, and in my case, I'm adding some lemon juice just to kill the enzymes in the eggs, you know, just for, for some extra insurance against bacteria and germs. And I'm also adding glycerin because that's going to make it so that this icing doesn't dry rock hard right away. It's still gonna dry some, but it's gonna hold its shape while not being hard enough to break your teeth as soon as I decorate the cake. So here's the cake. It is mostly dried around the edge where I didn't mess up last time. This part, not as dry as I'd like, but honestly, this cake doesn't have to travel anywhere and it doesn't have to last the number of months that it was designed for. So I'm not really too concerned because we'll probably at least share it with people over the course of the next few weeks. I'm gonna use the royal icing to make it look like there's snow and then of course I have all of the decorations to put on, which are completely dry. I have this old lazy Susan that I'm just gonna throw the cake onto and I'm gonna decorate on that because this just seems to be the perfect size. <laughs> Here are the 
decorations, and as you can see, they have dried. They're pretty much hard now. If I pushed really hard, they probably would still collapse. But on the outside, at least, they're not very pliable. So our Christmas dinner is done. It's time to pull the cracker. Okay. I won! I've never won before against him. Small and I got a hat. What is it? Oh, that's a hat. But what else did you get? Like a joke? or? Yeah, you should read it. I'll read the joke. All right, jokes. What's the difference between the Christmas alphabet and the ordinary alphabet? I don't know. What is it? The Christmas alphabet has no L. We did that one Wait, the other day. Wait, that was the same one. We had that joke the other day. Where did we have that? During my live stream. This is the most subpar batch of crackers I've ever seen. Indeed. Great. But All I like right. the hat. Yeah. Is it as good as my hat? No. Yeah. Unbelievable. The reason why we don't really have a Christmas cake in the same way that the Brits do and all of the variations that come from the empirical days around the world that still maintain that tradition in places like the West Indies to this day is because when the Puritans and with, when Jamestownians, I guess, came over um, you know, from the UK, yeah. then they have the kind of old style of a, of a Christmas cake, which is actually really just a fruit cake. Yes. And so it was decorated with nuts and dried fruit, if it was decorated at all. And that it's still the same kind, sometimes ah. a lot less boozy nowadays, um, which is sort of a shame because that's where it gets the reputation for being a brick from. Mm. But we have just a standard fruit cake, no real decoration unless you create a pretty design on the top or on the sides with fruit and nuts. And that's pretty much it. I see. And you're telling me there's alcohol in this. There is alcohol in this. There has been alcohol fed into this cake for the last three weeks. And I am telling you that if it weren't for COVID, it probably would have been fed for five weeks because traditionally you would feed the cake starting on the first Advent Sunday. Now I know what feeding the cake means. I, all this time you've been saying this to me, it just sounded like you were sort of feeding chickens, you know, just giving <laughs> it kind of seeds and things like that. So that helps it, that helps bulk it up then? Is that what happens then? No, it no. was already really bulky. Okay. It, it helps to maintain the moisture and it helps to keep the cake longer. Okay, well that makes sense because of the sort of alcoholic and preservative nature of alcohol. You have a tradition in your own family of eating what for Christmas? Christmas pudding. Christmas pudding is almost the sister Christmas food to the Christmas cake in that it is the older, wiser sibling of the Christmas cake that the Christmas cake sort of started to evolve into. Mm. So when we talk about plum pudding, they don't usually have plums in them first off, um, or Christmas pudding, then we're talking about something that derived from a porridge. Right. And it used to be an Advent porridge that people would eat that had dried fruits and nuts in it. And then it, eventually it became a Christmas pudding that you would wrap in a pudding cloth and then boil. And that's the thing that you remember. I see, yeah, because that's what we had every year, as you say. And it's probably wiser as a pudding compared to this because it doesn't drink alcohol. There are definitely alcoholic puddings. There are other are well, Christmas puddings. In fact, in a Christmas carol, a Christmas pudding is what the Cratchits eat. And that Christmas pudding is actually a lit when she brings it to the table. A lit, as in 
amazing lit. As in, she doused it with alcohol and then lit it on fire. I see. So we have the cake itself, which of course is mostly fruit and nuts. And then of course a cake batter that everything together kind of runs into. And then we have a layer of marzipan that is stuck to the cake with apricot jam mm -hmm. on top. What? It's actually kind of crusty, right? Oh, look at that. That's royal icing. You can do <laughs> it's it with very a fork. Large. All right, <laughs> I'll start here. Now, now you mentioned their marzipan. I am not a big fan of marzipan. I love the smell of it. It's so spicy and, of mm. course, alcoholic. <laughs> Thankfully, the alcohol does override the marzipan, mm. which is nice. Let's have a, a, a taste. Well, it's great. I must say, I really like it. If, I, if, mm. if this was my show, I'd be giving this some Lorenzo's about now. Not sure what I'd give it. Like I said, I'm not a big marzipan fan, but... You don't really taste the marzipan. It doesn't come through, yeah. You just taste the sweetness that comes from the top. I think that with the icing and with the marzipan, it just makes it sweeter mm -hmm. and thus more like, you know, a cake as opposed to a fruit cake where it's just the fruit. The sweetness kind of levels it a bit and makes it more palatable. I can definitely agree with that. And, and the weird thing is, I grew up in Britain, lived there for 26 years of my life. I don't think I've ever had it before, which is weird given the presence of alcohol in it. It, it just, it is pretty good. Is it as good as Christmas pudding? What's your view on that? I always ask her questions when she's got a mouthful. I think they're just different. They are. Yes. I think uh, Christmas pudding is really good. And in fact, if I do Vlogmas again next year, I might actually mm. make one. I will tell you, Christmas puddings are easier to make. Mm. This took days and each time that I had to do a different step, it took hours. I honestly thought after Christmas dinner that I wouldn't have any room to pack this in, but I really like it. So I think it's time for us to go and have one more drink and the rest of our Christmas cake. Yeah, uh, can we make sure that drink isn't rum? <laughs> I don't wanna get overloaded. Maybe eggnog? Eggnog and rum. Hey, remember this tune? from earlier in the video. That was made by my very talented guitarist brother, Otis Cantrell. And I would like to let you know that he does online guitar lessons. So if you are looking for a last minute gift for anyone, then all of his lessons happen online and I'm gonna link his website in the description below. So be sure to check it out. I have to thank you all once again for enabling me basically to come at you all 24 days of Vlogmas. This has been some of the most fun I think I've ever had. And I hope that our videos have given you cause to find at least a little bit of cheer in an otherwise kind of awful situation. And I wish you and your family, wherever you are in the world, the happiest of holidays. Bye. Happy Christmas. Bye.